Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Kat Hartshorn, and I will be your service leader this morning. We do hope you feel welcome here. The Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of the world community. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here today. We respectfully acknowledge that we meet on traditional Cree lands, now part of Treaty 6 territory, a historic gathering place of Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Sioux, Dene, Ojibwe, Saltu, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to enhance our vibrant community. In a time when the forces of irrationality and partisanship seem to hold sway, we light our Unitarian Universalist chalice. May this lamp of reason and truth serve as a beacon as we strive for a more rational, compassionate, and humane world. Our reading today is about groupthink. Groupthink is a psychological phenomenon that occurs within a group of people in which the desire for harmony or conformity in the group results in an irrational or dysfunctional decision-making outcome. Group members try to minimize conflict and reach a consensus decision without critical evaluation of alternative viewpoints by actively suppressing dissenting viewpoints and by isolating themselves from outside influences. Groupthink requires individuals to avoid raising controversial issues or alternative solutions, and there is a loss of individual creativity, uniqueness, and independent thinking. The dysfunctional group dynamic of the in-group produces an illusion of invulnerability, an inflated certainty that the right decision has been made. Thus, the in-group significantly overrates its own abilities in decision-making and significantly underrates the abilities of its opponents, the out-group. Furthermore, groupthink can produce dehumanizing actions against the out-group. And most of the research on groupthink was conducted by Irving Janis, a research psychologist from Yale University. Well, in last Sunday's sermon, I laid out a basic definition of the liberal philosophy and showed how our Unitarian Church has been inextricably linked to that way of thinking since our institutional beginnings a couple of hundred years ago. Liberalism at its most simplistic starts with a founding argument. Human beings were all born with the same free will, and we were also born with the power of reason. Therefore, All people deserve the same rights and freedoms and treatment before the law. Figuring out how these rights and freedoms should best be managed is done by the use of reasoned debate. Lay out your facts. Lay out your ideas. Listen to all the responses pro and con with an open mind and debate the merits before coming to a decision. Now that all sounds perfectly manageable, right? Um, Sometimes that's how liberal democracies have actually even worked. Sure, the ruling parties usually have a little more power to push things through, but most often they're kind of balanced by an awareness that there is an either side that's making its points, and usually some reasonably sensible compromises are reached. But that's been changing, as politics in many parts of the world have fallen into patterns of deep polarization. Instead of people with contrary policy views working through those differences, we have seen a frightening increase in partisan populism. The opposition is seen neither as a check or a balance or even as worthy human beings, but they are derided as being wild-eyed crazies bent on destroying the country. Good policy now matters far less than winning and holding power. The ideal of finding the best outcome for the most people has all but given away to getting the best for the people who will help us get re-elected. And reason debate has all but disappeared. I don't need to tell any of you that in the last few years, political campaigns, while seldom ever pristine or genteel, 
have gotten dirtier and meaner. And if you are someone who believes in reasoned and rational debate of issues, well, between attack ads and social media, you're pretty much out of luck. These days, it's only headlines and quips that get play. Substance no longer matters in the public forum, and that is pretty damn depressing. And ranting like this makes me feel a bit old and curmudgeonly, something I usually try to avoid. I prefer to be open to new ideas and approaches, to live and let live. But what I've been observing fills me with disgust, with anger, and sometimes with despair. So here's an example of the thing most recently getting my goat, as my dad used to say. I'm sure you've seen the spate of TV ads and billboards from Shaping Alberta's Future, a political action committee funded mostly by the motor industry and other private wealthy business interests. But what galls me most, I mean, the TV ads are bad and the billboards are bad, but what galls me most are these fake talk radio ads. Now, I listen to Chad some of the time, and this ad popped up right in the middle of the talk show. So consider this. The following is authorized by Shaping Alberta's Future. 1-800-615-3798. What's most important for next year's election? That's today's topic. Grace, you're up. Okay, for me, it's it's having someone I can trust look out for my family. I just don't want my kids growing up in Alberta buried in a mountain of debt. Sarah! We gotta scrap the carbon tax. Elect a leader who will stand up for Alberta. I agree. Kenny will do what's best for the province. So the UCP has your back. Absolutely. Totally. There's a lot at stake in next year's election for families across the province. More after this. Now, I'm not going to side with a particular political party here. Indeed, all parties are occasionally guilty of hyperbole, taking opposing policies out of context. But what offends me in this egregious example is the complete lack of issue. This is a sad masquerade, a fake debate. It's 30 seconds of scripted, angry opinions completely unsupported by argument or fact. It's people stating belief that has nothing to do with the reality. It's dog whistle stuff. Sure, some of the statements are true in the strictest sense. There is a carbon tax, for example, but it's used for funding green projects and public transportation, that's ignored. Rebates to families, that's ignored. Context is ignored. Can we call it a lie? Perhaps not. But I think we can label it deliberately and toxically misleading. Now, that kind of ad is not really new, and it's not confined to one particular party. But the frequency and the virulence we're starting to see is unprecedented. And what's truly sad about this decay of public debate is the attempted, deliberate dumbing down of the electorate. They don't want you talking about issues. They don't really want you learning what's behind it. They don't want you doing any research. They don't want you to think about it. They just want to play on your emotions. I find that I've had to regretfully give up on a couple of friendships because those former friends are no longer too willing to engage in a respectful conversation about public policy. And this goes on the right and on the left, whether it's bike lanes. (laughs) Boy, I get people going on bike lanes. Bike lanes, pipelines, pro or con, or public transit. There are people out there who know what they know, and anyone who thinks differently is a jerk. There is zero interest in hearing the other side. That's the tragedy. They don't want to hear the other side. They listen for points that support their views and ignore the rest. The psychologists have a term for that. It's called confirmation bias. Evidence that supports your belief is given far more credence than evidence which might challenge it. In a recent book, The Enigma of Reason, Mercier and Sperber refined the idea to what they called my side bias. Humans, they point out, aren't randomly credulous. Presented with someone else's argument, they are quite adept at spotting the weaknesses. But almost invariably, the positions we're blind about are our own. And it's not just the right wing that does it. I know I have to work hard to pay attention to the claims of those whose views differ from mine. Not just to disagree with them, 
but to actually listen to them and see, see what merit there may be. And I try. But I lost those friendships because other people wouldn't meet me halfway and have a discussion, a sensible, reasoned, calm discussion where we debate our points of view. And when occasionally I meet someone who's willing to have that conversation on the other side, it's like rain in the desert. It's just joyful to have a, a disagreement of opinions that's respectful. It is a natural enough tendency to want to support our own arguments. But if we claim to be people of intelligence, we have to be smart enough to look hard at our own facts and not get dropped down the rabbit hole of my sideism. Our absolute belief in our rightness has led increasingly to the polarization of governments that can't get much done. Another curmudgeonly pet peeve these days is the way the left and center media are copying the tactics, the very tactics that they most hate coming from the right. Too often I find myself embarrassed by the perpetual attack mode of the more liberal cable networks. On CNN and MSNBC and even the venerable New York Times, there is little chance that Donald Trump could ever get credit for doing something right. And yes, I will let my bias show in suggesting that there would not be much he has done that would be praiseworthy or able to be called right. But Fox News went ahead and reintroduced yellow jacket journalism to the Western world. And sadly, the left has followed and is responding tactic for tactic. And if you think I'm wrong about it, go home and try this very simple test. Look at a moderate or left-leaning news outlet and see if you can find a picture of the president where he doesn't look weary, angry, or just plain silly. They're kind of hard to find. In this, the outlets on both sides of the coin share a goal of inspiring their base, which is a really far cry from the ideal of reporting news fairly. And inspire their bases, they do. We saw an excellent example this fall in Toronto, at the Monk debate. Breitbart founder Steve Bannon was invited to debate David Frum on whether the future belongs to populist politics or liberal politics. Now consider, consider, this was a debate. It wasn't a speech. It was a debate, a designed and controlled exchange of ideas on opposing viewpoints. It wasn't a political rally, nor a single speech that could not be fact-checked. Nevertheless, and I find this just as distressing as some of the most absurd tweets coming out of the White House, elements of the left went berserk. Protesters, even the NDP, demanded that Bannon be barred from speaking in Canada. Protests and pickets were organized outside the venue where at least one police officer was punched in the face. The debate ended up starting almost an hour late because of the increased security screening of the audience. This is not okay. All right, this is not okay. One might be able to argue against a speech of hate remarks coming from a single source, but this was not that. It was a debate. Two distinct voices arguing their issues. And isn't that the rational basis of liberal democracy? Now, no doubt there was some objection to David Frum being the representative of the liberal side. David Frum, though born a Canadian, is a former speechwriter for President George W. Bush. And politically, he is an unashamed conservative. But as the extremely literate from noted in the Atlantic magazine, I've spent my life as a conservative, but what I've sought to conserve is not the Spanish Inquisition or the powers of kings and barons. I've sought to conserve free societies that began to be built in the 18th century and that have gradually developed and strengthened with many imperfections and hypocrisies and backsliding in the 250 years since. In other words, 
Frum embraces the same liberal philosophical approach that I embrace, even though we have vastly different ideas of how best to implement that vision. And he's even more articulate about his commitment to liberal democracy in the actual debate. He clearly stated several reasons for participating in the debate, which, by the way, he won, and this is one of them. I hope to speak first to the small numbers of genuinely undecided, to those who might imagine that populism offers them something. This is not true. The new populist politics is a scam and a lie that exploits anger and fear to gain power. It has no care for the people it supposedly champions and no respect for them. It will deliver nothing. Not only because its leaders are almost invariably crooks, although they are, but because they have no plans and no plans to make plans. Now, to me, that sounds like a pretty worthy opponent for Mr. Bannon, who, by the way, couldn't answer that point. And having watched the full video of the debates, I can confirm that he was. And I highly recommend these debates for you. Just look up Monk, M-U-N-K, debate, and you'll find it. It's very engaging and very interesting if you like any of this political stuff like I do. Now, I'll return to some of the points in the debate next week as I look for a hopeful conclusion to this series, but this week is about threats to liberalism. The first and the greatest is my sideism, or what the reading called groupthink. By the way, the, um, uh, the psychologist who developed groupthink, just as a way of pointing out that this is not just always pointing at, you know, bad guys or like Nazis or things like that. Um, first off, it was a Yale psychologist who studied uh, the, the whole incident of the Bay of Pigs, how the Bay of Pigs happened under a Democratic president with his classmates from Harvard. Um, so I find that kind of amusing that you have the Yale-Harvard thing going on. But it was actually an exploration of how that went so terribly, terribly wrong because everybody agreed with one another and there was no critical debate. And so a terrible tragedy happened. This groupthink stuff is the very opposite of rational discourse. Now, few will debate that the populists are doing a far more effective job of exploiting groupthink these days, although some liberals are trying to do the same. The populists build their strategies intentionally using this technique. Take the easy example of Mr. Trump. Absolute loyalty is demanded to his views and his leadership, and he therefore exists as the poster boy for the, quote, illusion of invulnerability, discussed as a prerequisite for groupthink. It is an irrational way of making decisions, and it's terribly dangerous. Now, sadly, that's crept across the border, most notably in the political strategies of Doug Ford and Jason Kenney, to a lesser extent, Andrew Scheer. He's just not as good at it. I'm not discussing their policies, but their strategies, forced loyalty, the demeaning of opposing voices and forcing division into in-group and out-group. Oh, and a rather cavalier approach to actual facts. Once you establish that kind of culture, once you establish that kind of mindset, it becomes really easy to follow the example of the Nazi propagandist Josef Goebbels. He wrote, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from political, economic, and or the military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent. For the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. And thus, by extension, truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Use its powers to, to repress dissent. God knows Mr. Trump has tried to do that, starting with dismissing anything that doesn't fit his agenda as fake news and any investigation of him or his allies as a witch hunt. 
And he has, unsuccessfully for now, banned a reporter he doesn't like and has mused about other limitations in the media. Mr. Trump and those like him declaim. They do not debate. And if you disagree, he derides and he bullies. He used much of the last year touring the country, speaking to rallies of adoring crowds. There is no possibility for debate there because he's the only one speaking. There are only his often absurd statements, his inaccurate, if not completely false, claims of accomplishment. There are his bullying attacks on those who will not bow before him, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, and his pandering to the crowd. Nothing he says gets challenged. The more absurd and outrageous the lie or the attack, the louder the cheers. It is groupthink at its worst, and it's mostly worked. No reasonable person thought he could get the Republican nomination. No sane person thought he had a chance of winning the election. No somewhat frightened person thought he would get through two years without being impeached. And now he has launched his 2020 re-election campaign. The rise of Trump and all that he represents has been the most deeply distressing blow to liberalism since the rise of Hitler. But there are signs of hope. But you got to come back next week to hear them. <laughs> Unless you want a two-hour sermon, you know. <laughs> Amen. Spirit of life and love, in this time of uncertainty, of fear and angst, the world holds its collective breath. In this time when rhetoric blusters about and words are used as weapons, the world clenches its fists, tightens its shoulders, eyes squeezed shut. Some are preparing for a fight. May we remember that we are a people of resilience. We have faced uncertainty before. We have weathered storms. We have been consumed by flames. We have risen like a phoenix from the ashes. And we will again. May we remember our shared humanity, our universal kinship, our interdependence as we unclench our fists and breathe together, breathing in love and breathing out peace. May we recognize the spark of the divine inside us all, even those we are not quite sure about. In this time of uncertainty, we remember the good will to go on as we work to move forward together, we the people seeking that which unites us, with our arms reaching out wide for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. May love prevail. Amen. The chalice is extinguished, but its light lives on in the minds and the hearts and the souls and the reason of each one of you. So carry that light with you when you leave this place and share it with those you know and those you love, and most especially those you have yet to meet or the stubborn ones who don't want to reason with you.